All right. So now we are coming up with our panel discussion too. And the topic is very much interesting. And I'm sure many of the participants would like to and keen to listen about it. So the topic is AI and IoT blended. Why it matters in IP industry. We have our key panelists joining in today, Ajita Abraham. She's a Deputy General Counsel, Legal Head, Capgemini. We have Sharon Schofnamera. She's a president with Activate IP. We have Luisa Herrera. She's the head of the IP department, GHA Lawyers. We have Mr. Anubhav Kapoor. He's a director of legal affairs from Fort India. And the moderator for the session, Karthik Kumar, partner with Finnegan, Henderson, Farabhol, Garrett, and Turner. So over to you. Thank you so much for that introduction. I just wanted to say, as I look across the, the resumes of the panelists uh, with me, I, I'm very impressed and also very happy to note that it's a mix of folks from uh, in-house with the businesses in, in the AI and the IoT industry, with partners who support them in outside law firms, as well as other um, consultants. So I, I think it's a great mix, and I, I hope to get a, a bunch of different uh, opinions and uh, diversity of thought and viewpoints. So I'm excited for this panel session. So let me start yeah. there. Uh, what I wanted to do is, to, I think the best place to start this discussion is to have an understanding of the AI and the IoT industries. Uh, and I can think of no one better than Ajita to call on. Just give a sense of, you know, what is, uh, what is your viewpoint on where these industries are headed and their synergies between them? Thank you, Karthik. Sure, happy to um, give uh, my viewpoint. Um, as we all know, intelligence and IoT are going to transformative change, and they're really rethinking the way businesses perform and even how individuals behave. IoT devices use the internet to communicate, collect, and exchange information about our online activities. Every day, they generate 1 billion gigabytes of data. By 2025, there's projected to be 42 billion IoT connected devices globally, so a huge number. As the number of devices increase, that means the amount of data will increase too. And that's where AI plays a role. It's lending its learning capabilities to the connectivity of the IoT. So while the IoT is a digital sensory system, AI transforms into the brain that determines decisions that control the whole system. AI and IoT combined are truly the superpowers of innovation. I, I was uh, taken back by the, the number you said when you mentioned 42 billion. Um, but I wanted to ask you, how do you think um, the AI and IoT industries uh, complement each other? Where do you see them going from here? Yeah, no, great question. Um, there, well, I would say there's like four main areas that, uh, that this combination is really going to make an impact on. Um, the first is wearable. So wearable devices uh, like smartwatches that continuously monitor and track user preferences and habits. Uh, another area that uh, will really be impacted is smart homes. So smart homes respond to your every request, are able to leverage uh, appliances, lighting, electronic devices, and more. And uh, they learn a homeowner's habits and develop automated support. I'm hoping that means you know one day we'll have somebody uh, clean the house and it won't be me. Um, but uh, <laughs> smart city um, is the other uh, sector. And the, these are innovations that are keeping pace with investments going towards improving public safety uh, transportation and energy efficiency. Um, an example of that is New Delhi, where which is one of the most congested uh, cities worldwide. And they're implementing an intelligent transport management system, which makes real-time decisions on traffic flows. So that's an example of how the smart city innovations are really uh, helping um, uh, with, with respect to urban uh, issues. Um, another uh, sector is smart industry, and these are industries ranging from manufacturing to mining, which are relying on digital transformation to become more efficient and reduce human error. Um, so as you can see, innovation combined with AI and IoT is accelerating um, you know, a lot of these new technologies. And I would say in the future, you know, there's going to be even more use of home robots, um, autonomous vehicles, 
and even natural language processing. Um, an example would be e-payments through voice authentication. So a lot of you know, exciting innovations um, are, are in the works. From a business perspective, where would you say Cap Gemini is is trying to focus its efforts? If you can disclose any of that publicly, suppose. No, no, absolutely. So Cap Gemini does a lot of digital transformation work, um, and it's actually leveraging AI um, to provide consulting services and to implement um, some of the digital transformation for financial services. Um, which is a sector that I work in. Um, so, you know, there's more automated uh, payment processing and there's an easier um, uh, sort of consumer experience uh, with the financial uh, institution. Uh, Anubhav, I know uh, I'd like to get your in-house perspective as well from Ford. Uh, where do you see the industry heading and what do you think are sort of the major challenges that uh, firms are facing from from an IP or an innovation standpoint. Yeah, thank you, Karthik. I think uh, uh, Ajita uh, gave a very nice segue into why uh, the IoT and the AI combination is gaining momentum. So, so, so on the topic, there were like two questions that we needed to address. One was why an IoT story is the blended story is the story that we should follow and what are the challenges from a IP point of view. So, uh, of course, I think uh, uh, the, uh, the, the IoT and the IP space is the fastest growing uh, patenting area uh, in the last few years and we are seeing a lot of patent activities in both these areas. And uh, uh, especially in the application of uh, uh, IoT and AI devices. And uh, in today's business world, uh, I think the adoption of IoT is uh, uh, helping us not only capture a lot of data from multiple sources, as uh, Ajita pointed out, uh, but wrapping this multitude of data coming from countless uh, IoT devices uh, is also making, on the other hand, uh, the processes very complex, especially the analyzing of the data part of it, because there is so much of data being collected, uh, but but the usefulness of this data can only be realized to its full potential. Where the IoT devices, uh, uh, these de collect the data collected through these IoT devices is uh, analyzed, and meaningful decision making can be taken out. That is where I think the whole IoT AI story fits in because for if IoT devices are the future and uh, they are, have to be exploited to the full potential, then probably uh, IoT devices need to converge with the newer technologies like uh, AI. And uh, uh, and and uh, per se, see there are many types of uh, IoT devices, but. IoT devices are uh, basically they are devices interacting using the internet, and at the core of these uh, IoT devices are sensors which are implanted into the machines which uh, stream data. Now uh, there are basically five steps uh, from a uh, from from a uh, technical perspective which are involved basically in IoT related services. These are basically uh, the creation, the communication of the data, aggregation of the data, analysis, and then the consequent action part of it. While I think uh, the IoT devices can uh, uh, very creatively do the creation, communication, and the aggregation, I think the last two part which really adds the value, which is the analysis part and the action part of it, is something that the IoT uh, sorry, the artificial intelligence uh, fits in very well, and that is where the value of the entire IoT devices is uh, uh, created, uh, and it unlocks uh, uh, great value and applications, and that is where probably the IP story fits in, because uh, the combination of the two is uh, creating a lot of new inventions and applications of uh, these two technologies uh, combined. Um, now, uh, coming back to uh, 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 some of the business benefits which uh, 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 Ajita uh, uh, 
outlined i think uh, there are several of them but uh, let us briefly touch upon some of the uh, five or six large business ben benefits uh, which these uh, technologies are bringing in and uh, and almost all the companies which are providing iot platforms like oracle microsoft amazon or salesforce have already started consolidating ai capabilities right so uh, so so i think the uh, it is not only boosting operational efficiency uh, and uh, uh, by by creating uh, uh, redundant by creating processes which are more efficient but also in they are helping us better risk in better risk management uh, self driving cars uh, is a good example of it waste management or uh, data center cooling cost are some of the good use cases that are there in public domain um it is also triggering new and enhanced products and services nlp was mentioned as an example so smart cities the retail analytics the bots that we see now coming they are all creating huge uh, new products and devices however uh, i think the from a ip standpoint uh, uh, there were recent cases like the dabus case in uspto which was filed in uh, uh, epo and uspto where the patent application was filed in the name of ai system right traditionally ai systems were used to assist inventions but uh, recently i think the scientists are now seeing uh, a lot of uh, patents that can be invented uh, uh, using the ai systems and what we usually refer to as uh, ai generated ips i think while these applications were uh, uh, rejected by the uh, uspto and uk ipo and epo uh, basis that the patents cannot be granted to uh, Uh, a artificial person it can only be granted to a natural person but it left many questions uh, uh, open with respect to if at all we had to kind of grant uh, 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 patents to a ai technology then uh, uh, what will be the questions of accountability how will we enforce infringements uh, and things like that so i can touch upon that later but in brief that is that is probably where the whole blend of ip and iot comes together and the importance to the ip world right uh, that that's really interesting um the the i often think when thinking about the apps decision i also think about the opposite scenario which is how would i like if my application were being examined by a piece of ai as opposed to a real examiner and or or if my case is being decided decided by a piece of ai as opposed to a judge um and that always tends to give me pause <laughs> <laughs> but i do understand kartik right now many of the registries do have ai systems responding to basic <laughs> queries <laughs> uh, but I, i would rather have justice meted out to me by a human being but who knows where we will go in the future uh luisa Uh, I wanted to give you a chance to weigh in from from an outside consultant law firm perspective. I know you're passionate about uh, promoting innovation and technology entrepreneurship uh, in Colombia. Could you please introduce your practice and give us your thoughts on how the patentability landscape is uh, in your neck of the woods for AI and IoT type inventions? Yeah, thank you so much. Yes, let me introduce you. Nice to meet you all, and thank you so much for the. invitation to ip gorina conference and for you all to be here in this panel about this interesting subject so in colombia um actually the potential uh, we have basically the same rules as and uh, the the basics are to comply with the patentability criteria so the novelty non obviousness and uh, industrial applications or as we know in industrial application or utility for example in the us in colombia the potential in this area in specifics uh, consists of the absence of patents we don't have enough patents right now in colombia so this is a good part but it's also uh, a thing a uh, disadvantage because it's really incipient is very new area in colombia 
we are developing this area. So we have, for example, in, in the last year, in 2020, we only have uh, one, four patents in this area. So development is still missing. The disadvantage will be when you want to patent in Colombia. And uh, the questions are if it is really attractive or not, and if it is uh, from a business perspective, it is if it is good or not to patent in Colombia or in Latin America even. What are the rules to take into account and what will happen to existing developments when it is patented actually in Colombia uh, from foreign companies, for example? And how the, does the enforcement work, which is the most important part? So my advice would be to, um, um, to see how the evolution of the concept of non-obviousness have been uh, show us the evolution through the evolution also of the technology. And we know that the non-obviousness concept has been evolved. Here in Colombia, patentability as in Europe and in the United States requires, as I said before, novelty, inventive steps or non-obviousness and uh, industrial applications or utility. The patent office in Colombia is rigorous, it's, it's very strict, but the criteria are the same that um, we applied in uh, or are being applied in United States, for example, from the criteria make in some court decisions as Bilski versus Capos and uh, Ali's case. And uh, we uh, know that abstracts ideas are not patentable, are not subject matter of patents. So in order to patent uh, in Colombia and in general in Latin America, it is necessary to comply not only with the patentability criteria, criteria uh, as said before, but also to have in mind that could be effectively, what could be effectively infringed. So to, um, and, and I think that is applied globally in the whole world. So if I want to sue, uh, I, I have to see what, how can I enforce my rights, right? So in that matter, I can project my claims and I can also uh, construct or build my claims uh, in the patent applications. Here uh, also we have to bear in mind that software are not, software is not patentable subject matter in Colombia. So we only uh, patent uh, or we only allowed patentability of inventions impl implemented by software, uh, which is also sometimes really confusing. And uh, actually recently uh, we have some patents that the essence is the software. So as such, the software is not patentable, but in this kind of inventions, at the end, it could be uh, patented. Or that's what we are seeing here right now in our jurisdiction. A common issue, and just to finish about this point and about your question, a common issue, uh, issue or question is whether IP is the best form or way to protect these technologies in order to advise our clients. And this is our practice also to see the whole strategy and to see if it is maybe better to uh, protect through uh, trade secrets. So if it is a learning centralized in the hub, for example, in IO, um, uh, Internet of Things technology, so probably it could be better to protect through trade secrets. But it depends on the technology, but it's important to bear in mind that right now in Latin America is still developing this area. In Colombia, we only have uh, last year four patents related to this matter. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a disadvantage because probably foreign uh, companies will be patenting soon and then they will enforce uh, their rights against these companies that are developing the national companies. Thank you for your question. That's excellent. And I, I want to echo, I don't believe the issue of patent eligibility of inventions in the space is necessarily all that much better in other jurisdictions outside of Colombia as well. Speaking for Finnegan, uh, I tend to practice a lot in the US and my partner Erica Arner had the privilege of representing Mr. Belsky 
at the Supreme Court in that case that you mentioned. Uh, but if you look at the evolution since then, uh, even in the United States, uh, I think it's it's fairly challenging to 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 get claims that are eligible for patenting um, and satisfy the novelty, non-obviousness, enablement, and written description requirements. So it does pose the question of what the best route is to protect your innovations in this space. And Sharon, I wanted to bring you in. I know as part of Activate IP, you're intimately involved in helping companies uh, strategize and, and develop their, patent, their, their IP portfolios. How would you weigh in on, on the pros and cons of these ways of protecting innovation and any advice for our, for, uh, our panel and our group? Yeah, so, um, so I think that's, I think we've actually touched on this all throughout the day. I think Mitch started with this as well. Um, I think in this particular area in AI and IoT and where they come together, this is a still a growing area. I still I still think that there's going to be changes in at the IPOs across the globe as we learn more, as we think about this as a um, as a patentable technology. But right now, it's very difficult. So we end up by having a lot of uh, clients coming in asking you know, what they should be doing. Either they've spent a lot of money to get nothing, um, and now they've, they, they, they're have they sort of behind the, the strategy game and they've, they've wasted maybe a year or two and they've got to go back and think about it. Or they, they, they're looking for some help and thinking about how they, they want to approach it. And I think from, uh, we, we always start with what are the business goals, you know, so, so you know, how do you think about the business goals? Because there are multiple types of IP uh, to, to maintain your market position. You know, it's not just patents. We talked about copyrights this morning, we, uh, trade secrets that Louisa just mentioned. Oh, you know, that th those are very powerful rights that can be, uh, but, but they're not, um, uh, they're not as clear, right, as and, and easily identified as a right um, it, described as, as you can with a patent. So, I mean, I don't want to discount, you know, no, nobody should get patents. Patents are very straightforward, right? So trade secrets, copyrights um, are a little more uh, nuanced. And so, um, so we look at it um, from a criteria perspective. So we look at what, what they're trying to accomplish, what the, the exact technology is, what the competitors are doing, um, how they're approaching it. And then we come up with, a, with a, the, uh, take a look at that. And, and also from the global market, what, you know, what, what, uh, what every country is, is doing. I think a fair bit of countries in this particular technology are similar to the U.S. and Colombia and the other folks uh, mentioned some so U.K. And, and Europe. So they're very similar um, at this time. Um, I think it will change over time, but it's it's certainly right now. Um, and and uh, so when you think about trade secrets, to me, trade secrets and copyrights, and you can also use trademarks. To me, trademarks are also underutilized and domain names. And sort of you know if you if you get that. Um, get those uh, trademarks associated with the inventions um, and those domain names, then you provide recognition and you, you get your market position from that perspective as well. So I think there are a lot of ways to approach it. And, and, um, and I, I, I personally think in this particular area, it, it's probably one of the most um, uh, complex one and taking that holistic approach is gonna be really important. So, uh, so we do a fair bit of this work, and even though uh, we might not always recommend patenting, I don't think that's something that's going to continue over time. I think over time we're going to see some changes, um, uh, just because you, 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 you'll end up by having everybody uh, working within trade secrets, and and um, and you're not going to, you know, you're not going to have that sort of global um, um, availability in the patents. So that's my thought. That's my thoughts there makes a whole lot of sense. And I think uh, when it comes to trade secrets, for example, they, there are still some things you have to do in terms of showing that what you consider to be your trade secret is one that's not readily ascertainable to the public, that you've taken exactly. reasonable measures to protect the confidentiality of the information, be it through contracts and other security measures, encryption, things like that, yeah. as well as you know training employees on the proper handling of uh, some intellectual property. So, the, and it, it is a challenge as well in terms of detecting uh, misappropriation and mm -hmm. having the controls in place to do that sort of thing. So there are challenges on the trade secret side as well, in addition to the other regimes. But I wanted to bring the conversation back to patents because 
one of the issues that we see as being common to both the AI and the IoT spaces is this issue of, of the fact that, that there are multiple uh, providers, if you will, in the supply chain, and, and there is a, a user that's quite separate that gains a benefit from it. So as looking at Ajita's sort of you know, big picture categorization of where the industry is headed and the applications that are of importance, uh, three out of the four, smart homes, smart cities, and smart industries um, will, would have you know, different players that are working towards the creation of the data, the communication data, the aggregation of the data, analysis, and the action, as, as Anubhav was pointing out, the, the sorts of things that you tend to do in blended IoT AI systems. As I look across those applications and the things that are happening in those applications, it seems to me that there are multiple players involved at every step of the process. You might have one company providing infrastructure, one prov company providing software development on top of that, one company may be providing maintenance services on top of that, an actual user of that infrastructure to, to process the data and then an end benefit that, that probably migrates to an end user, uh, an individual as a member of the public. One of the issues that you tend to face in the United States patent law is the issue of divided infringement. Mm -hmm. uh, it might be that to get a claim, patent claim allowed, you might need to recite multiple different elements to overcome the prior part. And the risk you face there on the other side of the equation when it comes to enforcement is that some of the elements of your claim might be practiced by one entity and some of your other elements might be practiced by a different entity. So this, this raises issues of divided infringement because under United States law, typically you need one direct infringer who practices all of the method steps of the claim. That's the general rule. Uh, you do have an exception where you can show that one of these entities was directing or controlling the actions of all the others so that you could impute the actions of the others to that one entity and therefore you now have this one direct infringer. But that's generally speaking uh, an exception to the general rule that you need for your patent claim to be enforceable against someone, that that one person or one entity uh, does all of the steps in your claim. So now you're stuck between trying to get your patent allowed and eligible and novel and non-obvious, so you need to recite multiple elements. And then on the flip side, when you try to enforce it, you need to now show that there's one entity reciting all those elements that you had to include to get your claim allowed. And so that, that brings another piece of tension into the mix, at least under United States law. Uh, I wanted to get, since we have a nice diverse panel, I wanted to get perspectives from other aspects, uh, from other jurisdictions. Uh, maybe I'll start with Anubha, you know, from, from an Indian uh, law perspective, how, was, how does that play out and how do you handle things from an in-house perspective? Yeah. Uh, uh, Karthik Ajita, are you going or can I... Um, yeah. Uh, uh, so, Karthik, on this this aspect, uh, India is still at, uh, we don't have many cases uh, uh, which are in this area, at least in, in the Indian jurisdiction, right? So, uh, I think, but even if in the future, if it comes, I think this issue would still be there, right, on uh, the, the divided infringement uh, uh, liability and I think the core issues right now, uh, uh, in, apart from that, whether a patent can be, AI patent can be granted to a uh, natural person of no, or not, even if we get over with that, I think the two core, two core issues uh, that still remain on the table before we can have any uh, substantive law or, or changes around it uh, continue to be one in terms of uh, 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 accountability and and then the determination of the infringement liability, right? And uh, you touched upon both the aspects that if if a machine itself, one way is to kind of grant the machine the right to own a patent. In this case, uh, uh, the owner of the machine uh, would probably that is a concept that we that can be evolved in terms of uh, that the person kind of owns the uh, liability, but that's not a very straightforward concept, right? So uh, I think that entire area, uh, I think some part of it has recently been addressed by the uh, uh, proposal adopted by the EU parliament uh, on 21st of April, the paper that came out, uh, which addresses uh, uh, 
uh, some of these, um, at least it lays down certain principles in a very clear way uh, in terms of how the liabilities have to be determined and what are the responsibilities uh, for, uh, for various uh, uh, AI systems. And uh, they have kind of approached this entire thing, uh, um, uh, 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 liability question from a from a perspective of uh, dividing the AI system into four categories, uh, which is like basically the unacceptable risk, high risk, and limited risk, and minimal risk, the four categories. And uh, they have kind of uh, uh, kind of uh, put obligations uh, against each of these uh, categories uh, and imposed uh, uh, on the various stakeholders uh, certain obligations and duties. Uh, including the provider, the manufacturers, and the, and the entire value chain, uh, which is involved in the AI system. I think that probably could be one of the ways in which uh, uh, the, the liabilities could be determined through an obligation mechanism. But obviously, this is the start of a debate uh, before even uh, this proposal that has been uh, 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 given by the EU, EU Parliament, I think there will be a lot of debate because of the number of stakeholders that are involved in it. So it's still a question that is, I think, evolving. But uh, uh, the core questions are in terms of uh, the determination of the uh, liability of the infringer and the accountability. Who owns the AI AI uh, inventions will will be the core to answer those questions. thought that occurred to me as you were talking about how you might assign liability is how you might li manage liability from your own perspective in terms of indemnification. Uh, what I mean by that is you have so many different actors in this in this overall chain to supply the ultimate service or product. Um, I've seen various ways in which one might try to assign risk associated with infringement. Uh, and one of which is, is indemnification or obligations. Can you can you speak generally speaking to to your experiences in this area? Um, whether that's something that is, I mean, how how does how does that tend to work at your firms? Do you have issues generally speaking when you try and assign liability for different things when you're working with customers, partners, rent, vendors, clients, things like that? Uh, any any insight you can give us on, on those issues would be pretty helpful. And and this is a question generally for anyone who wants to wants to jump in. Sorry, Anna, I'll just give a very quick um, my quick feedback. Just working for consulting, um, I would say you know of course every party involved wants to disclaim liability um, for uh, any intellectual property infringement. Um, I think a lot of it just depends on what you're bringing into the project, right? So, you know, Capgemini does have its own tools um, that it could be using to analyze the data. Um, in that case, you know, obviously we need to, you know, provide uh, appropriate uh, indemnities with respect to the we're bringing into the project. Uh, but I would say what we're really trying to do is make sure if we're working with any partners, any third parties, um, that they're responsible you know, for indemnifying us and we in turn indemnify the client. But it's, it is quite a tricky um, issue, um, especially as I mentioned, you know, when there's three parties, when you're partnering with you know, uh, another entity um, that is part of the project that's you know, also uh, could be either analyzing the data or has their own tool that we're incorporating into the data, and then obviously with the client. And then I think ultimately with the client, the issue is you know, the deliverable. Um, who owns the IP to that deliverable and, you know, often they, you know, of course they want the, to own the entire, uh, have all intellectual property rights, the deliverable. So we have to be very careful about ensuring that we're carving out any pre-existing IP, understanding, you know, do we need to enter into a subsequent license agreement um, if they need to continue using some of the tools uh, provided by Capgemini. So, you know, these are all like very sort of bread and butter IP issues, but just made all the more interesting um, with uh, IoT and uh, AI, given, you know, the, uh, the additional component of data, who owns the data. Um, so that, that's my take from a consulting firm perspective. Great. And um, I see a question in, in the, in the Q&A 
So I'm going to bring that up for any of the panelists to, to address. Um, as Smita Power asks, as we increasingly move to a cloud software as a service instead of distributed software, uh, particularly that might be reverse engineer. Um, how do you protect? How do you best protect your IP? For example, given that you have to provide full disclosure of your invention uh, to to get protect patent protection, would you be better off getting trade secrets? Uh, I wanted to see if you could, if we could, maybe as a group, try to talk about some of the pros and cons of trade secret versus patent protection. And maybe I'll start off by addressing it from a slightly different angle, which is uh, the issue of damages. Since we've, we've been talking about liability, maybe I'll talk about damages for a little bit. Now, typically, when it comes to a patent, right, the, the general rule is United States laws apply only in the United States. And that's no exception for patents in the IoT or AI space. Uh, so patents, the United States patent laws, generally speaking, only apply to activity that, that happens here in the United States. There are some exceptions where if the system is abroad, but the beneficial use of that system is obtained here in the United States, then the a United States patent would still be enforceable against that foreign system because it provides a benefit rooted in the United States. There are other small exceptions where if there is a product that comes out of the pat a patented process and the process is done outside the country, but then the product makes it w its way into the United States, then a method patent can still be applied against that foreign process, even though, generally speaking, United States laws are, do not apply extraterritorially. So you're generally uh, limited to the United States jurisdiction. You also, generally speaking, damages tend to be what are called a reasonable royalty. So the courts will try, if there's a finding of, of uh, liability, then in terms of damages, a court will try to go back and, and recreate a hypothetical negotiation between the plaintiff and the defendant that occurred just before the time of the first infringement by the defendant. Um, and it takes into account about 14 different factors to try and figure out what they would have at, as willing license or licensee have come to terms with in, in terms of a royalty base and a royalty rate. And you multiply with those two things to get a reasonable royalty. Um, in, in competitor litigation, the comp and where the competitor is a plaintiff, you can also get lost profits, meaning you get the profits that the other side accrued by use of the invention. And there's always a question of how much of the actual sale or revenue or profit should be apportioned to the specific feature that's claimed in the patent. So it's a fairly complicated process, but that's in a nutshell sort of how things work when it comes to patents. When it comes to trade secrets, you can get, and these days in the United States, it's much harder to get an, uh, an injunction against ongoing activity uh, that is infringing you're much more likely to get monetary damages, not so much get injunctive relief to prevent the other side from uh, pursuing their currently infringing activities. Um, the exception is if you go to the International Trade Commission and ask for importation of the infringing product to be blocked. So if there's a sensor that's coming in that goes into a field, which then becomes your IoT network, and then is used with AI to, to drive data-driven results, then you could potentially block the sensor as an infringing piece uh, that contributes to the overall infringement by that system. Uh, but that's a rare exception that only applies when you go to the International Trade Commission for relief, as opposed to going to the district courts, the federal district courts. When it comes to trade secrets, however, you have a patchwork of laws. You have a bunch of state laws, and you also have a federal law, the Defend Trade Secrets Act that was more recent. So you have this patchwork of laws that you have to contend with. And typically, you also have to deal with other tort claims like unfair competition or civil conspiracy and things like that. So it's a much more complicated analysis to figure out whether there's liability in the first place. And then you tend to have a much more of an opportunity to get a broad permanent injunction against a, mis a misappropriator. Um, and you also can, in some instances, get worldwide damages, even uh, though you're possibly in a state court litigating the issue of trade secrets. So very different uh, analyses and scope when it comes to damages from a trade secret versus a patent uh, standpoint. Um, any other thoughts about differences in terms of should you go down the, the route of trade secrets or down the route of patent protection? The only thing I would add, 
Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know why that that came out so loud. I, I'll be quieter. The only thing I would add is um, you were talking about those nuances, and so you know how you think about it from a company perspective. There's investment in patents for sure, um, and and the uncertainty that's that's around these particular types of patents. But there's also that investment in um, in trade secrets. If you're really going to go down the trade secret route, you had better put in some significant investments. Otherwise, you're kind of dead in the water from the start. Um, I I would like also to add um, Kartik uh, about what you're saying, but just adding because you you sum up everything like in the in in some words. But uh, in relation to what Sharon said before about the trade secret. At the end, this industry is um, uh, the, their characteristic is that we need the te technology, and all the technology is related. That's why the standardization and uh, the technology standardization. That's why licensing, for instance, the friend licensing in other jurisdictions, and all of this. So I think trade secrets would be. Um, uh, an obstacle for this, an obstacle for the licensing and for the technology transfer. So I think it's, it's better in this moment, um, well, and even in the future, for the development of this area to uh, prioritize the technology transfer. And technology transfer would be possible with patents. Great. And, and I think for India, there is no trade secret statute separately here. So I think most of the claims of uh, uh, under trade secret are contractually enforced under the common law, right? So um, I, I think as a in, in IT, uh, except for the longevity or the speed at which these, uh, if, if you're not expecting the technology to be stable for a long period of time, otherwise this trade secret doesn't very effectively work uh, like it has to be enforced under the common law. So that's the nuance for India. So, <clears throat> but still people are going for trade secrets or they don't go for registration of their uh, technologies under the IT space uh, in the IT sector, especially. Great. Thank you so much. And um, I, I see, we have uh, we've probably come to the end of our session, but I, I wanted to take the chance before we ask, open up the group for questions to, to thank each and one of you. I had a great time preparing and, and chatting with you before today's session. And then at the session, I, I, I learned a few things that I could not have thought of, thought of that were really helpful. So I'm, I'm personally very happy to have been here, part of this panel. Uh, so I wanted to thank each and every one of you. Uh, for your, Absolutely, for your So, uh, if you would like to conclude this session in one or two sentences, so what it would be? Oh, <laughs> I got put on the spot. Okay, uh, I, I think the the key is is to is to understand where the industry is heading as a whole. You know, we're looking at a number of potentially multi-billion-dollar industries worldwide, with with global supply chains and massive consumer markets across multiple continents, right? And you talk about smart watches, smart homes, smart cities, and smart industries. That is a very broad exactly. spectrum of industry um, and potentially a, a broad swath of innovation that comes along. We're trying to compete effectively with, with the competition in that global in that global space. So it is important from a, from a patent or an IP management standpoint to, to proactively think ahead in terms of given your particular firm's emphasis in, in terms of where you're going to uh, apply your recent de development efforts and your your product development efforts, how is the how are you going to protect your research and development investment? You have to think of that carefully. How are you going to assess your risks as you enter those markets um, and you compete in those in this fora? How are you going to protect your innovation so that you're not unfairly competed against? And there are multiple ways to do it. And then you also have a large number of partners to work with, uh, which means that the issue of, of who is going to bear liability for any particular instance of, 
of difficulty down the road is something that we have to proactively think of as as attorneys and as business people while still fostering an environment in which we can collaborate with each other because clearly that cooperation is going to be the key to success against everybody else who's trying to cooperate and collaborate in these market spaces so it seems like you really have to think ahead and think smart from a business perspective as well as a legal perspective to set out the pieces of the puzzle uh, for success that's how i see it from the panel absolutely so thank you so much to the key panelists for joining in for today's session so all questions for them so you can write down on the chat box on the right or you can come directly face to face and ask them directly uh in the meanwhile i'm very much grateful for you all that is you know karthik you know managing and moderating the session very well and also the key panelists and speaker joining in today and giving the inputs about the subject thank you thank you so much great thanks everyone see you on the other side thank you yep. thank you thank you all bye Bye. Bye. Thank you so much and bye from here.